this guy um, here and have this goes on top. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to go ahead and Testing. get started. I uh, wanted to welcome you all out to uh, a new a new Grand Round series that is uh, not terribly creatively called Patient Grand Rounds. Really, this was born out of uh, the residents and some collective feedback that uh, during our clinical faculty day or resident alumni day, a lot of the conversations and the, inter the interactions between the experts and the subspecialists were really beneficial. So we have asked each subspecialty to take a month, and the f uh, in general, the fourth Wednesday of each month will be dedicated to patient presentations, uh, hoping again to foster discussion among the subspecialists. Uh, Dr. Moshefar graciously uh, accepted the reins of both cornea and the refractive months, and being that he has a fellow, I think he just wanted to make sure the fellow had an opportunity to present uh, as many times as possible. So. Carl Fenzel. Please. Um, sometimes when it becomes uh, July, we get a wave of uh, refractive issues come to us. And uh, some of these cases may actually look very similar, especially uh, the last two case. Uh, and in one of them, there's actually a take home message. Um, we had a lot of other cases too that we could have presented, but we wanted to show things that are uh, obvious and quite frequently we see, and not some zebra things that we see all the time. Uh, and uh, they are primarily uh, have to do with the uh, you know, PRKs and Lasix and what happens when you enhance, what happens when they have had PRK and they have a long-term course. Because as you know, there has been a wave of PRK. Many, many uh, uh, refractive surgeons now are shying away from Lasix and going to other surface treatments and uh, there's nothing wrong with either procedure in my opinion but uh, uh, today we focus more on problems with uh, surface ablation and enhancements thank you thank you professor and just to uh, introduce uh, the professor's fellow Carl Fenzel grew up in Florida is coming to us by way of New York uh, Medical College um, so uh, without further ado uh, turn the time over to Carl to keep in mind that the residents asked for this, so they are fair game asking any question you want. Um, call them out individually, it helps, uh, but also realize they don't get any real refractive training until their chief year, and none of them have completed their chief year yet, so Jim Bell actually has completed his chief year. <laughs> um, but he went into retina, so I wouldn't ask him any questions, but please. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Carlton Fenzel, and on behalf of Dr. Moshefar, I'd like to present refractive surgical complications. So our first case, I'd like to start with a 31-year-old female. She has no medical history and no surgical history. She had uh, LASIK performed for myopia and astigmatism, and she had a great result with her right eye. However, she had some undercorrection of her left eye. That gave her a vision of 20-50, and she was obviously um, quite displeased with that result. So. She had an enhancement performed of the left eye uh, about seven months later, and subsequently her visual acuity decreased, and she was found to have epithelial ingrowth with haze, some mud, craps and cla uh, mud cracks in the flap, and um, so naturally the surgeon decided to go in there on the second post-operative day, and he reused a relifting technique. Uh, he brushed out the epithelial cell cells with a deeper blade, and he used a wet cell sponge, and he applied alcohol afterwards. Uh, Pred Forte, four times a day, was then prescribed, and uh, the visual acuity again decreased after that, and Muro was prescribed. Uh, over the next year, there were quite a few interface to abnormalities associated with this patient, and the, the visual acuity declined to 2100, and uh, this patient was referred to the Moran Eye Center. So as far as interface to abnormalities go, and uh, corneal abnormalities after refractive surgery and LASIK. There's a couple things on the differential diagnosis. Obviously, epithelial ingrowth is important for this patient because they have a history of it uh, previously, but diffuse lamellar keratitis, infectious keratitis, interface debris, central toxic keratopathy, pressure-induced stomal keratopathy, and also postoperative ectasia are also very important on this list. So here's a picture of the patient's eye. You can see that there's quite a a significant amount of nests of epithelial cells all around the entire uh, 
flat edge right here. Um, there's some scalloping here. It's kind of difficult to, uh, to see in this picture, but that signifies flat necrosis. And what we're really focused on here is the uh, ingrowth of epithelial cells right here. You can see in this magnified version, I have the arrows. It shows right on uh, the edge of the visual axis, you can see the epithelial ingrowth. So as I just said, we have severe epithelial ingrowth. We have actually an absence of the flap hinge, which, which was superior, but must have been transected during uh, either the enhancement or the flap lift and flap necrosis. So this patient had close follow-up, which yielded an improvement in vision uh, to 2060. However, uh, on a couple different follow-up uh, appointments, there was noticed that there was advancement of the, of the epithelial ingrowth in that exact 2 o'clock uh, location and visual access involvement was impending, so it was deemed necessary to perform surgical removal to prevent any type of scarring within the visual axis. So I guess this is the time when I have to ask the residents what they uh, want to do with this case. So do you guys have any recommendations for this? And because Eileen was nice enough to call me this morning, I I'll, I'll ask her <laughs> what she thinks. You know. Obviously, you well, we're doing surgical, uh, a surgical correction right now. So you know the patient already had a flap lift and had some alcohol application. So you know, is there anything else that you might want to do other than that to try to help prevent um, you know, this epithelial ingrowth from coming back? You, know, you don't want to keep doing scrapings over and over and over again. Oh, we're not going to go that far right now but um, so you know you could lift and scrape it alone which you know I wouldn't recommend for this the patient already had that done and already had alcohol uh, placed before and you can apply alcohol mitomycin C you could do uh, PTK there's actually also been reports of using it YAG laser to um, application actually prevents some of the epithelial cells from moving in and progressing on the ingrowth a tissue glue is important for the flap edge, and also suturing of the flap edge has been shown to be effective. Uh, to seal, I think, could be used. Yeah. So for this procedure, um, actually, Dr. Wilson in a 2012 JCRS uh, article talked about what's called a flap araxis, and he used a Sinsky and a forcep, basically you delineate the uh, about one clock hour of the edge of the flap with the Sinsky hook and then use the forcep to peel back the flap. Now this is important because if you're using um, some sort of device to actually go underneath the flap and all the way into the center and lift up the flap, you have a significantly increased um, rate of epithelial ingrowth afterwards because it's thought that maybe you're implanting the epithelial cells with that motion all the way onto the, either the flap bed uh, the um, stromal bed or the flap. So this is performed with the Cohen forceps between, uh, the flap was lifted between 10.30 and 3.30. And a uh, beaver blade was used, a sponge irrigated, the sponge was used again, all to try to remove all the epithelial cells that were present. And then a 10, 12 10 nylon sutures were then used uh, to suture the flap edge within that area. And uh, tissue glue was also uh, used at the flap edge. So here's a photograph. You can still see, it's, it's difficult to tell, but you can still see that there's, the epithelial cells down here were not removed. It was, it was purely this area. It was retracted and then it was sutured again, and you can't see any of the epithelial ingrowth here anymore. So the postoperative regimen included Predforte, Vigamox, Tears, a shield, and uh, these medications were tapered slowly. Um, sutures were removed between seven and eight weeks and a bandaged contact lens which was placed was also removed at about nine weeks. And the patient had a, a good result in terms of visual acuity to 2025, but did notice some fuzziness and some ghosting. But um, most importantly, there was no recurrence of the superior ingrowth that was removed and the inferior ingrowth remained stable. So under our second case, this is a 34 year old male with no medical or surgical history. Uh, he had He went for uh, refractive surgical intervention, and uh, okay. yep. So, I think one important thing in the case one to remember is that uh, obviously the patient improved quite dramatically, but 2025 the patient's likely to have ghosting in the future, and, and I think one.
Yeah, Joshua, so that's a great point. Yeah. Brian? When you were talking about him being somewhat tender and somewhat shaky, was that just a reference or was that? That was uncorrected. Okay. Sorry about that, yeah. Some of the terminology, you know, I had to look through a lot of the notes from the, um, the referring doctors, and some of them didn't specify. So we will sometimes jump back and forth between uncorrected and, and best corrected. But that was uncorrected. I think suturing is considered a better um, a treatment if you choose one or the other, but you know it, both of them, both were worth it on this. Yes. It's called the Belgian syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well. Hey, I would want both done on my eye. So. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Moshfar. Any other questions on case one? Okay. So case two is a 34-year-old male, uh, went in for refractive surgical evaluation, was recommended to get PRK. He was a rugby player. He was worried about trauma. Um, then when he went on for the day where he was actually going to have the refractive surgery performed, a different surgeon recommended that, you know, you might as well get LASIK. It's great. You'll have a vision, uh, you know, a day or two after, and you'll be really happy. So. This patient went in for LASIK. It was a lot of difficulty with the procedure. He was really uncooperative, um, thrashing about. There was a partial thin flap that was created in the right eye that was not lifted. And then the left eye, they, they attempted, but they weren't able to do anything for that. So they aborted the procedure. The patient was given his money back. Um, then he went to a new surgeon for a consultation. And 19 days later, he was recommended to have PRK. and. Um, he had a lot of pain and blurry vision afterwards in the right eye only, which is the eye that had the partial flap. And his vision at two weeks was about 2050, 2030. His cornea was clear. At that time, Pred Forte was discontinued. Four months later, his best corrective visual acuity was 2020. But he did was noted to have some subepithelial haze centrally in the right eye. And this kind of makes sense because haze, on average, uh, presents around three months. And, um, but no topical <coughs> medications were initiated. Five months, he's 2020 vision again. He's had epithelial haze again, subepithelial haze, excuse me. Um, no medication was initiated at this time. So this was quite a while ago, a couple years. Over that time, his vision began to decline. Um, he had went for evaluation with different refractive surgeons, different contact lens specialists. He tried rigid gas permeable contact lens. Um, but he was intolerant to these lenses, even though it improved his vision significantly. And he had really crippling glare and photophobia. So he was referred to the Moran Eye Center. And uh, this is a picture of his eye. You can see that he has these subepithelial areas of, of haze and some scarring centrally. Here's another view. You can see on this view that it's really very anterior in position. And here's a nice picture of two different cuts of anterior segment OCT. And you can see 
that you have these hyperreflective subepithelial deposits in multiple different areas of the cornea. It really goes from here all the way down to here. So you know, wh what is this? Is it just chronic haze? Is it fibrosis that's now occurring? Was there some DLK? Was there a low-grade infectious keratitis? And you know, like I talked about before, the flap was actually decentered in fair nasaling. Uh, there was epithelial fibrosis and there was central reticular haze. So whenever you create any type of um, incision or uh, insult to the cornea, there's going to be an inflammatory response. Um, Metalloproteins are, are produced, growth factors are produced. And if you superimpose another event on top of that right after, you're really at a significant risk of having haze, inflammation. You're activating those keratocytes and they're producing. And um, so, you know, you really got to do something about it. The first thing you can do is wait. So you let the cornea calm down. You, you let that flap settle down a little bit. Let those keratocytes calm down a little bit. But if you really, you know, there has been some information in the literature about complications with flaps. And people have wanted to, um, they've wanted to correct those complications right away with PRK. And they've done it right away. And they've been successful because they've used mitomycin C. And mitomycin C is important. It's been shown to actually decrease um, production of matrix metalloproteinases, growth factors, and actually deactivate um, keratocytes. So uh, it's important to have the right plan when you're doing this. And so as far as treatment for this patient, you know, he's three, three and a half years out. He has not only haze, but he has fibrosis, and you can see it on the OCT. So, you know, there's a couple of options. We're really trying to get rid of um, those subepithelial deposits, and you could do topography guided PRK with mitomycin C where you basically use alcohol to remove the epithelium and then you use topography guided PRK. It's hard with this guy because he's had multiple uh, procedures done so you really don't want to remove too much tissue um, but that's an option. The other is just simply mitomycin C application and with this instead of using alcohol you actually scrape off the epithelium and, and while doing that you can actually remove some of the haze, remove some of the subepithelial fibrosis and so you know if he didn't want another treatment that would be um, that would be definitely be an option in this case. the Valium on, they confirmed the surgeon that I you, sh you should get LASIK. LASIK is the much better choice for you. And uh, he, w he was a very tight orbit, uh, uh, squeamish, had a very hard time with putting the suction on. Eventually, they got the suction on, made the flap in one eye. And the other eye, they couldn't even make the flap. And uh, so I think that was one mistake there that, you know, maybe you should get some PRK or uh, LASIK on every day with a better informed consent. Uh, the other issue is now the management of what we have uh, on board. I think 19 days later, when he goes to see another colleague, uh, both of them very respectable colleagues, by the way, and uh, I don't think, as, as Carl mentioned, Dr. Karanjo mentioned, I don't think we should be doing PRK on top of that flap or minus four that or correction, minus five that or correction. First of all, we have to ask ourselves, there could be still inflammation going on at the interface of keratocytes in that area. And if we continue zapping through that and we get to that interface because we are doing uh, four or five dots of correction, then we can actually create more inflammatory process. So what I'm trying to say is that those reticular patterns that you saw centrally, th those are very different from the haze we're going to see in the other cases. This was not one of those hazes that we see six millimeter haze, 6.5 millimeter haze that we see with the eczema very small little cap of four millimeter, 
three and a half millimeter livid color central case with a reticular pattern that uh, Dr. Sancho showed. This indicates that the flap was thinner, uh, I'm sorry, the flap was thicker than what they thought. And when they, uh, when they went through it, most likely after going through 80, 90 microns, they eventually reached that interface of the anterior stroma and the posterior stroma of the flap. And as a result, a portion of the flap was completely ablated and now you have like a little donut if you want to say because some of the ablation still stayed in the flap but some of it went through the flap and hit the exposed stroma underneath there. See my point there? So that's why you get this just a little centralized uh, haze which is a little bit eccentric to the pupil. Whenever you see a generalized haze with a CIK, you can assume that maybe the steroid wasn't given or the patient wasn't compliant and you need to, but if you ever see a patient come to you and has a very small, eccentric, four, three millimeter haze, you have to ask yourself why. And I think in this case, we zapped through the entire epithelium, we zapped through the flap, and we reached that interface 19 days after the original surgery. That was one of the problems. If it was maybe a year later or a few months later, maybe it would have been a problem. The other problem was that uh, we didn't use mitomycin P. I think these are the cases that mitomycin P would have been good. We all have seen flap complications with the old microkeratome. Flaps would be six different pieces. They would be completely severed. And what we did with those, sometimes within a month or two, we went back. We didn't wait three months. We now wait longer, but we would use mitomycin C on a hot eye because we knew if we had a hot eye within the first month of the original surgery and we do anything to them, we need to use mitomycin C. Otherwise, there would be an accelerated recruitment of keratocytes, which would convert to fibroblasts, and then they would lay these abnormal collagen fibrils. So in this specific case, this uh, rugby player, he used to be a professional. Now, he is on disability, uh, and uh, he cannot wear a mitomycin lens. Uh, they tried a rigid gas, I'm sorry, scleral, a rigid uh, large diameter lenses. He cannot tolerate that. So he walks around with a you know, 26 division. The other eye is 26 to 20. And I think we can always be the basket driver and say, oh, well, he shouldn't have done this or she shouldn't have done that. My answer is that, no, because we need to learn from this. And what we learn is informed consent should be done better. And the other thing is that when somebody already had a little insult to their eyes, as Dr. Sanjay mentioned, you should wait at least three months to let the eye quiet down before you go and try to do something because we make it through that interface, especially if you're doing the minus eight, minus six, minus five down there. Now, maybe if they're doing the minus two, you would get lucky, you wouldn't get that far into the interface of that flap. But when you go deeper, 19 days afterwards, and not use a mitomycin C, this is what happens. So, so what did you do with the patient? Okay. Did you start taking the way you had? Uh, one, we waited for, uh, you know, should we do this uh, before the litigation is over? Because I oh, really so this, is, this is now in the case. Right, it is, and uh, I'm, I'm still saying that, you know, we cannot say this was a medical malpractice. A separate informed consent part that we're talking about right now, uh, which I don't have any expertise, but this is not really a medical negligence. But uh, uh, I think uh, we could have done things differently, so being a basket driver, we can always say stuff. But what should we do now? Uh, one of the things that we have done, we have done multiple maps of this eye. And I do know there are some lasers now that have the capability of doing topography guided ablations with the epithelium on board. You just put the fight factor of that into it. Uh, one of them is the Wade Light or the Allegrotto or the Alcon company laser. And you can hook that up to the Wade Plus map, which is a basically an Allegro analyzer. And it gives you this map and then you try to do the treatment, but as Dr. Sanjay mentioned, first you just take the epithelium off with alcohol, very uneventful, and then you do the treatment with the mask, and then you can apply the mitomycin C. But if you don't have the ability to do topography guided stuff and all that fancy stuff, the thing that we can do is you take the good old beaver blade, you find where the direction of the hinge is, because you don't want to go against the direction of the hinge of the flap, although very unlikely to lift it, and you simply drape the epithelium off. And then you will continue to go towards the stroma. Except this is a situation here. If you keep going down, remember you have a button head flap most likely there. So if you keep doing this too fast, you may start lifting the edge of that button hole in the middle. So the 
job needs to be clinical and once you pass the epithelium you will continue to use your beaver blade in the direction parallel to the hinge from hinge downward basically and you remove a little bit more of that thick epi uh, uh, fibrosis you can actually feel and you can hear that sound and then after that you put the mountain C on for it stays a bit cleaner but the computer will say that you can still go back to 20 or 30 seconds it stays a bit back to cleaner and stays a bit more about it. The only thing is, in this one, most likely the spine needs to be cut and needs to be smaller. There is no reason to expose the entire area to a seven millimeter sponge. I think you may need a smaller uh, and uh, kind of a sponge of a five millimeter to two millimeter range. So that's what I would do. Thank you, Dr. Moshfar. On to our third case. This is a 34-year-old female with no medical or surgical history. She went in for uh, epilasic surgery on uh, January 2014 for moderate myopia. And uh, mitomycin C was applied, 0.3 milligrams per milliliter for 20 seconds, then flushed uh, with copious amounts of BSS. The, um, the epithelial flap was actually removed. Uh, so this is um, flap off epilasic. And steroid, antibiotic, and NSAID were applied. So just a little uh, overview of epilasic. Um, basically, you, you do a corneal epithelial flap that does not penetrate Bowman's membrane uh, with the epicaryotome. And then you, you attract it, you apply the laser treatment, and then you can either do flap on where you put the epithelium back, or you can completely transect that epithelial flap. And um, so in this case, it was done flap off. So one week postoperatively, uh, the epithelial defect healed. Uncorrected visual acuity improved to 2040 and 2060. There was some mild haze noted, but um, Triforte was continued. Uh, but however, over the next two or three weeks, the vision got worse, there was more haze, and the patient was referred to a cornea specialist um, who initially thought that because of the circular nature of it, that it's possible it could have been infectious in etiology. Um, bacterial, viral, and parasitic cultures were performed, and all, they were all negative. Um, so the patient followed up with their refractive surgeon and the, the vision continued to get worse in the right eye. Um, and it was noted that there were large bullae, uh, stromal edema, increasing haze, and a stromal puncture with bandage contact lens uh, was performed afterwards, and uh, the bullae actually resolved. At the third month, uh, the vision got a little bit better in the right eye, but then the left eye got a lot worse um, as a result of the same etiology. There were bullae, there was stromal edema, and um, so Pred forte was decreased a little bit, but she was put on um, tears and Miro and a bandage contact lens was applied. And she was referred to the Moran Eye Center. Um, it's important to note that she had really extreme amount of photophobia as well as decreased vision. And by the time she got to Moran, her vision actually improved. So this is her right eye and her left eye. You can see that there's a decent amount, two plus haze right here that extends all the way to the periphery. Um, and you know, the treatment is usually about five to six millimeters, but it actually extends all the way out to the eight millimeter size of the epikeratome uh, created flap. Here you can really only see it centrally, but it, it also extends all uh, to an eight millimeter diameter. So, you know, she was kept on uh, bandage contact lens, she was given a medrol dose pack, put on Pred Forte for Q2 hours, and then tapered. and. Uh, Combigan was an important part of this uh, management as well. Uh, and she improved significantly to 2030 and uh, 2040. The haze improved, and she had subjective improvement with her photophobia. Um, she was, her pred forte was decreased, and uh, the bandage contact lens was continued. And these are her photos a few weeks to months later. You can see that there's a, a decrease, slightly decreased amount of haze here and here as well. You know, so what really causes, you know, we think that there's a couple different possibilities for this. Was it something related to the epikeratome? You know, these epikeratomes are designed, um, they have a special blade that is designed not to penetrate Bowman's in intestroma. It's usually set at a specific depth. Now, different companies make different depth um, epikeratomes, but um, for the most part, they're really only supposed to cut through the epithelium. Um, but it's possible there have been case reports saying that it's actually gone through epithelium and there's been 
stromal dissection with these blades. The second possibility is mitomycin related. Um, this was done at a, a surgery center. They get their mitomycin. They actually have to mix it there, so they get it from a pharmacy. Is it possible that they didn't mix it properly? It was too high of a dose, and uh, there's some sort of mitomycin related toxicity. I, you know, it could also be some sort of low-grade infectious etiology. And we'll, we'll talk more about this after the next case. So case four was a very similar presentation. 31-year-old female, no history, happy LASIK performed on the exact same day by the same surgeon at the same surgery center um, for moderate myopia, astigmatism. She had the same amount of mitomycin C performed, applied in the same fashion, and uh, it was flap off as well. And she had steroid antibiotic and NSAID drops applied. Uh, on the fifth day, her epithelial defects healed, and her vision was really not that great, but um, after three weeks, she had a significant improvement to 2030 and 2040 with a minimal amount of haze. Then at the second month, she started having problems. In the left eye, her vision declined to 2100. She had more haze in that eye. And then two weeks later, she started having the same issues that the last patient had. She started having stromal edema, microcystic edema, and bullae in the left eye. Uh, the same management was continued in the right eye, but uh, practically forte was discontinued in the left eye and she had a bandaged contact lens placed along with a subconjunctival injection of Kenalog. And uh, over the next seven days, the bullet actually resolved. This is a cross-section of the cornea OCT of, the, of that patient with a bullet. With a bullet, excuse me. Uh, so, yep. Yes. So at the third month, she started having worsening of her right eye as well as worsening of the left eye uh, with more bullae. And she actually had three staining lesions that looked dendritiform. Uh, so there was concern for herpes simplex epithelial keratitis. Um, the pressures were noted to be 10 and 22, and pred forte was discontinued in the right eye because of that dendritiform lesion, and um, contact lens was applied. So she was referred to the Moran Eye Center uh, with a visual acuity of 2060 and uh, 2150 best corrected. The pressure actually increased slightly in the right eye to 16 and 22 in the left eye. And she had moderate punctate epitheliopathy, mild microcystic edema, two plus haze, and she had uh, trace decimase folds. But no dendritiform lesions were observed during that evaluation. So here's a photograph uh, of her right eye. You can see that she has this haze here. It's really difficult on this photograph. There are some decimase folds. You can probably see it right here but it's difficult to really get an idea for the epitheliopathy. Here is a, as a better photo, you can see haze, you can see the microcystic edema with this uh, sclerotic scatter photograph. So this is an interesting part of, of the patient's history. Um, specular microscopy was performed in both eyes, and uh, while it's hard to see the morphology of the cells here, the most important thing to look at is the cell uh, density per millimeter squared. It's extremely low. And you know, here's the, the normal range, and usually it's around 2,500 or even higher, but she's at 1,385 here and 1,312 here. So that's highly unusual. You know, we don't have a comp preoperative comparison, but um, very unusual for a patient of this age. So she was started on Pred Forte four times a day, Combigan, Tears, Restasis, as well as a bandage contact lens. And at two weeks, she actually improved very significantly to 2020, 2025, her epitheliopathy and decimase uh, folds had completely resolved, and she had corneal haze uh, that was still about the same. Um, so uh, the pred forte was tapered slightly, and she was kept on all the other uh, therapies. Over the next couple weeks, she had some fluctuation in vision, but she had improvement in haze, and her uh, bandaged contact lenses were removed. Um, then after about two months, which was a couple weeks after her bandaged contact lens was removed. She started having significant uh, decrease in vision, pain, mucus discharge, and photophobia solely in the left eye. And her vision had dropped down to 2300. And it was noted that there were three feathery crystalline subepithelial deposits with overlying epithelial defects in that left eye. Here's a photograph. You can see that there's two, about a millimeter, maybe 0.75 millimeters in size 
uh, feathery, sort of crystalline, it's hard to tell here, um, uh, subepithelial uh, areas with the overlying epithelial defect. Here it's kind of easier to identify this crystalline appearance. You can see the third lesion right here. You know, so what could this be? You know, this patient has been on steroids and contact lenses for months. So it could be a lot of different things. You know, we got to think about the normal flora. Staph um, would be, epidermidis would be the most common. Um, but we also got to think about fungal keratitis because of the history of the steroids and the um, contact lens use. Uh, in this case, candida would be our most likely uh, uh, fungal etiology for that. So, you know, infectious crystalline keratopathy is also something that we got to think about. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of organisms that have been documented in the literature that have been, um, have a crystalline appearance. Uh, strep viridans, the alpha hemolytics, are the most common, but, you know, pseudomonas, um, quite a few other different types, Klebsiella, have all been um, documented as having cases uh, been involved in crystalline keratopathy. So, you know, it's kind of hard to figure out what this is just based on looking at it. So this patient was started on Vegamox every hour and natamycin every hour, and the Predforte was stopped in both eyes. And as far as the cultures that we performed, gram staining is negative, fungal culture was negative. But inter interestingly enough, Enterococcus faecalis uh, <coughs> was found to be the organism and sensitive to vancomycin. And you know, I did a pretty significant search of the literature, and I did find one case of um, infectious crystalline keratopathy. Uh, that had been associated and uh, with Enterococcus faecalis, so it is possible. So because of the vancomycin sensitivities, but also because we thought this was unusual and we didn't want to miss something, you know, it takes a long time for the fungal cultures to come back. We put the patient on vancomycin every hour, but we continued the Vigamox for more broad spectrum antibacterial coverage, and we kept the natamycin on every two hours. And uh, after about three days, it, it almost melted away. There was no more crystalline deposits. <coughs> and uh, the vision improved. You know, it was only 2080 because um, they were more focal areas of more significant haze uh, underneath where those deposits had been. And you know, this is not the greatest picture, but I just saw her recently, and you can see the more focal areas of haze here. Um, it's really hard to see the baseline haze that she had had before, uh, but obviously a lot better than what she, when she had the fungal or the uh, Enter uh, coccus faecalis uh, problem. So, as far as the last two cases uh, are concerned, you know, we think that there may be multiple reasons why she had this problem. So, like I talked about before, the epi epikeratome stromal penetration is a significant problem. Uh, uh, of the reports in the literature, some people had left the, the stromal dissection intact for a couple of months, three to four, like we had talked about before, that would be the appropriate thing to do. And then they had performed PRK afterwards and they had no issues. Uh, they didn't use mitomycin C. And then other, uh, one other account actually kept the flap down. They had noticed some folds, but then they had talked to the patient and decided to actually perform PRK uh, or the, um, just the eczema laser ablation right over that uh, stromal dissection. And um, they used mitomycin and they did have a worsened effect on that eye compared to the other eye. So there was some complication. There was some small amount of uh, stromal, antistromal opacity. So, you know, it is important to really think about these cases uh, appropriately. Um, and also, like we talked about before, mitomycin toxicity could have been, um, could have had some sort of thing to do with this. We're not really sure why the endothelium has decreased in, in count per millimeter squared. Um, but it's less likely than some problem related to the epicarate keratome stromal penetration. I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts on this. Dr. Olson. Yeah, would you, uh, you know, I, I saw the literature on this. How in the world is epi laser flap off different from PRK? Is it height? Is it area of damage? And, and um, I, I've just not seen any comparative studies that suggest that you even have a that question. Um, the nomenclature is quite uh, um, complicated, but we know the PRK. We also know something called late exit fatigue, 
we also know something called epileptic with the eye. So the PRK you guys are quite familiar with is what we do here, Dr. Mitch and Dr. Tagasaki. We remove the uh, epithelium, and the epithelium can be removed mechanically or transepithelially with a laser or with alcohol, and then we do the laser treatment and the epithelium is not even there anymore, it's all gone, so that's PRK. Lace X with the E is you actually use a, a, a form of a much lower concentration of alcohol. You maintain your flaporexis, as was described in, uh, in Friedland's uh, clinic, and you basically lift that epithelium and put it in the corner. You still have it, you do your treatment, and then you put that epithelium back down like a circle. So it's still a flap of epithelium, but you separated that by using a very diluted alcohol, and you put it back on, and you put the bandages on again. So by definition, if Dr. Mitchell next time is doing the case, and even though he's using his 18 or 20% alcohol, if he finishes and then he puts his epithelium on, then you cannot call that PRK. You have to call that lace X with the E, okay? Now what is epilasic with the I? Epilasic with the I is when you use a mechanical modality to create the shearing force to separate that seven layers of your epithelium from the underlying surface. Now it could be over the Bowman or under Bowman, we still have a hard time knowing that. So is it taking the entire basement membrane off? That's the challenge, we don't know. But when we say epilasic, which was done in this case, it was with the mechanical machines, which was a Moria epitherium. Um, so did that answer your question then? But in terms of the high provided, but this is the difference is, between. Is there any study that shows that that's superior to uh, PRK? No, actually not, and because of these ambiguities. Um, <coughs> so the take home message, first of all, from this is that you can be a great surgeon, and actually this is one of the top notch surgeons that I know of. I have a lot of respect for this individual. There's nothing wrong with this captain did, but this captain is at the mercy of this guy who brings the epitheritone to him and wants him to try it. And he says, sure, I'll try your epitheritone and also at the mercy of the person who's diluting the micromycin C. So then at the end, he's the one who has to get blamed even though there were other factors involved, but at the end, everyone's gonna blame the surgeon even though who knows who made that micromycin C correctly or the epiteratome that this sales pitch guy brought and he was trying it. The fact is, the both of these cases happened on the same day and it's very hard to know, was it the micromycin C and was it the epiteratome? But the fact is that the haze, unlike the other case, was diffuse. You could see this haze almost like eight, eight and a half millimeter. You could chase it to the edge. So the fact is there was a flap that was amputated and tossed down. But the question is, is that flap, as Dr. Olson is trying to mention, was it really 40, 42 microns? Or was it in some area 42 microns, in some area 65 microns? Or maybe throughout the whole thing was about 65 microns. Now, as you know, when we do LASIK, we do 100, 110 microns. We used to do 160 microns. Now we do 100, 110 microns. Now, sometimes we do 90 microns. And what is that? That's called sub-Bowman keratomalosis. It's thin flap LASIK. Sub-Bowman keratomalosis or SPK. This is an ultimate SPK, I think. The flap was most likely a 60 or a 55 micron flap that was lifted, and in some areas, most likely it took some of the stroma off, and in some area, the stroma was intact. So when the epithelial, when the laser treatment was done, there were some areas that you basically had no flap on. And for those of you who had the experience of amputating the flap, the patients afterwards develop uh, almost a seven and a half or eight and a half million uh, epithelial, I mean, stroma case. So we, I personally think that there wasn't an issue with the mitomycin C and it was primarily a depth abnormality with the epiteritone. And is it good to put an epithelium down on the eye once it's treated with alcohol for shearing force? Absolutely not. It actually creates what Dr. Uh, Olson is trying to refer to. It creates this reduplication, recurrent corneal erosion sometimes, microcystic changes, and it can create problems. That's why we always toss that out. And when we started doing lace X, we used to put the epithelium, I actually, thought that we should put the epithelium, they would heal faster, and it actually retarded the epithelial healing. Now with epilase 6 
what it is is that they claim it's just a, just a very nice uh, epithelium. You put it down, you're not using alcohol, you're not using 20% or 18% alcohol, so you should not have any problem. That epithelium is still alive. The challenge is that it still causes epithelial problems as they age and patients can get erosion. This case, though, the surgeon very wisely just discarded it because he knew that it would retard the healing. But why this patient still developed these chronic epithelial slough and all that? So I think the take home message one was that, you know, sometimes you are the captain blaming for other people's responsibility. The other thing is that both of these patients, one of them is a head nurse and one of them is an endodontist. And they're both suffering right now and they're getting better. The third time message, why did I use Combigan on this case? Why did I use Combigan? The fact is this patient has been on and off on steroids. When I saw them, the epithelium was very raggy. Both of them were extremely sensitive to light, both of them. By the way, those pictures are not done by Jim. They are all done by this uh, iPhone holding the eye open, so we apologize <laughs> for that. <laughs> so we're just using our iPhone, we don't want to trouble you. Uh, but uh, the, the fact is both of them were quite sensitive and there are literature that talks about mycomycin C can cause chronic photophobia for a long time. So is it uh, epithelial chronic erosion that made the uh, microcystic changes make them sensitive? Was it mycomycin C made them sensitive? I don't know. But I do think it was an epikeratin related problem and uh, a diffuse haze is gonna hopefully get better. Cornea remodels, that's the amazing thing about cornea. You see somebody with a terrible scar, you see them 20 years later, sometimes that scar may not even be there. Epithelium uh, and the platocytes remodel the cornea nicely. So we're hoping that these patients will get better with time. Why do I use Combigan? It has alphagan in it. And when somebody has had Kenalog injections and this and that, I don't know what the pressure is. There's no way of knowing the pressure. Is it 22 or 30? So what I do, when I see patients like this with very bad epitheliopathy, I put bandage nails on them for six, seven weeks, as if I'm treating erosion, and I put them on Combigan with steroids because I think that Combigan is gonna bring the pressure down, and the alphagan part of the Combigan is going to constrict the blood vessels so there would be less of inflammatory mediator getting into that eye into that epithelium. So I like to use it so the eyes stay whiter, they're more blanched, and uh, they would be more, they're more comfortable too. Makes the pupils smaller, so they are less sensitive to light. So that's why I like to use Combigan in these cases that I have no good grasp of it, along with the steroids, along with extended bandage lens. Both of these patients are doing well. The endotondrist still cannot go to work. One last take home message. This lady has a home what do you take home? Nurse, uh, not nurse, and um, childcare. Has a home childcare, this mm -hmm. kid comes. We think the enterococcus fecalis was actually from the diaper. She does take care of little kids with diaper. And that was my fault that this patient got enterococcus fecalis because I have this patient in contact lens with steroids on board. I caused the infection because if there was no contact lens and there was no uh, steroid on board, this one may never have gotten the enterococcus fecalis inside his eye. So the reason sometimes we put these patients in contact lens, we have to watch because there is this risk of infection. So the take home message is, watch out for the patients that you put in contact lens for erosions or whatever, and you put them on steroids. This is not my first time I've seen this in my own practice, but this infection was as a result of our management. Patient, thank God, did well. We were on top of it. But the uh, enterococcus fecalis, crystals, we always come think it's streptococcus, no. I have seen crystals with everything. Uh, so crystals, we don't know, but uh, this was this one was enterococcus fecalis. Anyway, and uh, one other take-home lesson is: remember, it's instrumentation. We're looking for a lesion. It was a cell thing. And uh, uh, you know, we read knives in many, many, many different flavors of different meats with all kinds of flavors. You get you get crystals all the time, and a little bit of time shows that the, the, the flame. Is
the other thing with the high grade is you can see the catalytic coming out. You know, the oxidant states are really low, high alpha five. You can see something catalytic over and over again. If it doesn't work, most of the article that says, oh, by the way, this doesn't work, you just don't hear about it anymore. And so that's the sad part. You hear all the time from everybody that's excited, but nobody says, oh, by the way, that didn't work, so what are you thinking about? You just said, gee, I haven't heard about that. What happened to that? And it just slowly fades away. Yeah, and there have been some, you know, there's conflicting reports on the effect of mitomycin in terms of patients who have PRK, but there's definite large studies that have show changes in uh, morphology and endothelial cell count after um, its application. And there was a study um, that used, that analyzed patients who had epilasic, their flaps afterwards um, using microscopy and actually showed that there really was no functionality of the flap, that actually epithelial cells were growing underneath it and replacing it. So it's probably not the best thing to be using. Brian? Are these, these are post-refractive patients or just patients no, in general? Just, just patients in general. Do, do you see it come, like, like you saw with the mitosis of the renal chromal, when it's definitely old, I mean, I think the first thing you got to check is that the pro- I mean, the first thing I think you got to check is the pressure, you know. Right. If the pressure's sky high, you know exactly why they have edema. Um, but, I mean, it, they could be having epitheliopathy uh, for a different reason that could look like um, microcystic edema. Um, so, you know, definitely check both those things, and I would, um, it really depends on the exact scenario, but um, likely it's an effect on the endothelium if there's stromal edema and microcystic edema. Uh, but you have to remember the acoustic 
chalk up the thinking that they do, even though people think it's quite literal, no, you still can catch and think it and repeat it. So the ability to chalk up that completely out, even if it's flying demon, will be transmitted through some vibration into to that monolayer in the Ethereum. So I, I still think that uh, it does cause some transient changes in the Ethereum, but they go back to normal. Uh, people from Greece have shown that there is a transient change in the end of the year. It's mortality. Any other questions? All right, thank you.